Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2 Live for Saturday, August 15th. Today's topic is our featured teacher, Tammy Polk. And I will turn the mic over to Peggy to introduce Tammy. Hello to all of you. And I am so excited to have Tammy Pogue with us today as our August featured teacher. You may recognize her name as Aunt Tammy. Aunt Tammy. If you've participated in other Classroom 2O Live webinars, because she has been a regular participant for many years. And she always has such great questions and tips and ideas to share in the chat. Her encouraging comments and her many links, ideas, and resources have been so helpful. And we are so fortunate to have her in our personal learning network. She's also a fabulous member on our Classroom 2O Live advisory team. And she not only helps us brainstorm and seek out great presenters for our webinars, but she's helping with some of the behind the scenes tasks of preparing for our show. Tammy's currently teaching English to ninth graders. She has taught for 32 years in independent college prep schools in Texas, as well as in her native Georgia. And in addition to her secondary experience, she has served as an adjunct professor at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. And she was a summer fellow at the prestigious Klingenstein Institute of Columbia University. Would love to have her come back and share some about that. And she's also received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tammy was a very early adopter of technology in her classroom, which is no surprise. And when you see the great tips and tools she has to share with us today, you'll understand how she has learned to integrate technology in her classroom, not only to make it more engaging for her students, but to help her as a teacher be more productive and to manage her classroom tasks more efficiently to benefit her students. So even though she teaches high school, I know you're going to learn about some great things that will work for any grade level that you'll want to share with other teachers. So be sure to add her to your PLN by following her on Twitter, Aunt Tammy. And now I'd like to ask Tammy our newbie question and turn the rest of this presentation over to her. So our newbie question is, Tammy, how has technology changed your teaching? And take it away. Thanks. Uh, well, you know, I am from the generation that started with mimeograph machines. And the big technology for us was the new automatic mimeograph machine that you didn't have to turn uh, where you didn't have to turn a crank. You know, you just push the button and you would get your mimeographed copies. So that's how far back I go. Uh, technology changes every day. And I think sometimes people of my generation, we, we get more excited than our younger colleagues because we know what it was like to have to type on a ditto page and uh, or run it through a heat machine. Uh, to make the master copy to put on the ditto machine. Uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't as much opportunity to differentiate for various students. So every time something new comes along, you know, it really excites those of us who were around when we didn't have all those things. So I guess I would have to say it changes every day. <laughs> um, so that's why I called this presentation tools old and new, because there are some things that I use today that I was using 10 or 15 years ago when they came online, but they have improved so much. And you may not hear about them as much uh, anymore, but they're still very useful, or they have morphed into something that may surprise you. So that is 
where I want to start. Of course, there are a lot of tools that I won't have time to talk about, but I thought I would uh, at least show you some of the major ones that I use. Um, as Peggy said, I teach in Katy, Texas, which is uh, a suburb of Houston. And I don't really blog, but except for with my class, but I do have a Twitter account at Aunt Tammy. I'm an old maid school teacher, so I use that as my uh, as my handle because I am the aunt to two perfect children. This was my first online tool. Uh, and it was Easy Test Maker. I've been using this for years and years. And it was so thrilling to me when I first found it because I didn't have to make the test look beautiful as I was trying to type it or set it up on my word processor on my early computer. But this would do it for me. And I could also save my test. And perhaps from an early test, I could then make a, a later test uh, or an exam. You know, I could take a, uh, I could take some questions from an early quiz and put them on an exam. And I could print out just these beautiful professional looking tests. And here you see where you can get folders now. Uh, they've kind of, you know, again, as it's upgraded over the years, there is a premium version as well as a free version. I use the premium because I use a lot of the premium features. Um, the folders here are um, you know, I have one for for Shakespeare, for grammar, for literature, whatever I need to do, and that I find that very helpful. It tells you the days that you the day that you originally made it. Here is the um, the format that you use for actually making the test, and as you can see, and I'm going to try the little pointer that. Uh, I was shown last night. Let's see if I can make it work. <laughs> I'm not doing very well with that. But ah, oh, maybe. You can see that you can pick a variety of different types of questions. And something else that it does that I really, really appreciate is that if I need to make a word bank, it will do that for me. So. So you can see here, I can, if I'm making fill in the blank, it will automatically create a word bank. And I do have some students who require that as part of their um, accommodations. So if you need to do that, maybe for some students you could do it, others not. But that's, I found, again, very helpful. And then. It became even new and improved. And this was such a thrill to me, because now I can put these tests online. And whether I'm using them for formative assessment or for summative assessment, uh, I can do it online. And the student gets immediate feedback. And I think that is one thing that we can really thank technology for, is the fact that we can give students immediate feedback. And as you can see here, uh, you can do the um, you can randomize the questions so that each student is seeing different questions at a different time. Uh, you can show them the graded test score or not. I always do. If it is a formative assessment, especially, it's not one I'm necessarily putting in the grade book, but one that the student just wants to find out, do I understand this yet or not, uh, you can give him the corrected paper uh, immediately. He can see what he got right, what he got wrong. I'm always having students coming up and say, I don't understand why I missed this one. And so we can look at it together on their computer or on mine. And we can discuss the one that he missed. Because I can pull up anybody's test and see exactly what each person got right and what each person got wrong. Um, so I just can't say enough good things about Easy Test Maker. It's very simple, but it is extremely useful. Uh, then you get a link here for each test if you want to put it online. I put the site link on my live binder. And I'll talk about how I use the live binder in a minute. But I put the actual site link 
uh, right here on my live binder, and that will list all of the tests that I have that are current, that I currently have live, and you can put them on and off, you know, at will. So something may be closed or open. You open it if you want it to be available, and you close it when you're finished with it. So all of the current ones are on my live binder, but if you prefer, you can just give a single test uh, link out. And of course, I always change these to tiny URL first. I don't give out there or give them a link, you know, that's that's easy to, to just click on. Uh, but you can do that. The student simply puts a uh, a code in, whatever code you set. You know, it could be Apple, the word Apple, or whatever you want it to be. And once he puts that in there, then it just says, what's your name? And goes on, starts the test. But the students don't have to sign up for anything, which is another great advantage here. Planbook EDU is wow! What a what a favorite this is of mine too. Uh, several years ago, I tried a Planbook uh, software that I had to buy and download to my computer, and it was it was fine, except that I realized that I had it on my Mac at home, and then when I went to school for uh, and had to use my PC, it, it was. It was local. I mean, it was locally stored, so I couldn't go back and forth. Planbook EDU is in the cloud, so I can access it from anywhere. It has some wonderful features. It's very easy to type onto the um, onto the calendar. There, you can set it up for uh, as we have block schedules, or you can set it up for. Uh, an eight-day or eight-period schedule, whatever you happen to have. The standards, a lot of the state standards are listed, as well as the Common Core. If you want to incorporate those, I do not have to put those into my lesson plans, but I do like to refer to them from time to time. Uh, but if you have to put them into your lesson plan, this is very easy because they're all listed. So, for instance, all of the Texas state standards are there, and you can. Uh, go find them and, and just stick the one that you want into your plan. If you had to share it, let's say, with your department, you can share uh, with others. You can share your plan book with whoever you want to. And that's a great feature. You see the, the share button here. And then uh, another great feature is that you can bump a day forward. You can list a day as an off day. Uh, you know, so if you have a snow day or something, you can bump everything forward. You can also, as you see with the green arrow here, you can put files into the day. So since I do uh, Google Slides for each day, like a PowerPoint for each day, I can include those slides in my plan book. If I happen to get sick and somebody else had to take over my class, they could, if they wished, just click on my slides and at least see what I had planned to do that day. Now, instead of an assignment book, um, I use or an assignment list. I use my live binder, and I said instead of the assignment book, because some of my students have started using live binders on their own. But I have a class live binder for each class level that I teach. For instance, this one is called uh, AP Cubs uh, because that's for my AP class. I have, as you can see, a lot of tabs and then sub tabs under each one. I also use the base tabs sometimes. Base tabs go under sub tabs. That is part of the premium level of live binders. So you can see that I have syllabus and general information. That's the one that's open now. And I have various sites, uh, you know, various information. Right now, for this year's live binder, really, I think all that I have there is the syllabus. And their first assignment is to go to the live binder, print the syllabus, and bring it back to class. So that tells me that they know how to get to the live binder. Again, I use a tiny URL for that. Uh, and um, they know how to get to it. Hopefully, they've bookmarked it. 
and they can find anything they need on the life binder. For my ninth graders, I find that that works very well. I tell my ninth graders, I am organizationally challenged. That's, that's always been a difficulty for me. Live Binders has really helped me with that. But as I tell them too, you know, you have to learn from other people and you might have to work a little harder to stay organized, but we're going to try to work together to keep everything that we need in one place. And as I said, many of them have found that the Live Binder works well for them in their own uh, schoolwork. You know, they'll have one uh, with tabs for each one of their classes. Certainly not required, but something that uh, uh, that a lot of them have chosen to do. Uh, I have an assignment page, so all of my assignments are listed. Actually, the way this screenshot is showing, it shows that the assignment, this is like typing right in the Live Binder, which you can do, but Actually, I, I, it's rarely that I do it this way. I usually have a Google document that is embedded there so that I can do it on a Google document and not have to, you know, it kind of saves me a step. I'm not sure why I did it that way this time, but apparently I did. Um, <clears throat> again, just showing some more of the tabs here and all of the uh, sites that, that might be there for everybody to always be able to refer back to. One of the things that you need to remember when you're putting a Google document or Google Slides, as this is, is that you need to make sure you have the share setting on the Google document uh, set to anybody can view. And you put that link into your Live Binder. So you, um, you put that and make sure everybody can see it. I do slides each day, again, since I'm organizationally challenged. And I'm teaching six classes over two days because we're on a block schedule. I, might, I find that the slides are very helpful for me as I'm going through class, just to where are we? <laughs> and I can also put a note on there, you know, period C only got this far, period D only got this far. So I can uh, remind myself as I go along. This also, of course, is, is wonderful for those students who weren't in class that day. Uh, it keeps them from having to try to write down uh, everything. It, they know that they can see the slides. And again, when you're talking about accommodations for certain students, some of them are required to have a hard copy of notes. So here you have it. It's just built right in for everybody, not just uh, a few. More writing resources. I was just showing the fact that uh, I do have a link to wonderful things like the OWL at Purdue, the online writing lab. That's fantastic. If you don't know about that, please check that out. It's free. Uh, it's you and the students can go there and find so many resources for writing. For instance, the MLA format is all set up there for you. One thing I don't think I have on here, but I usually put on my live binder, and I don't have a slide for it, but it's EasyBib is another a great website for them to use where they can put the information if they're making a bibliography. Um, yeah, they can put that uh, right in there and that's another great resource to have in the Live Binder. Now, my school has a kind of, I, I guess it's on the primitive side, uh, great book. I, I'm not sure how all these things work, but this one, it does have a Dropbox. It has something where the student can electronically submit an assignment. But what it's missing is a way for that student to get back that assignment. So I thought, well, what am I going to do here? Because what good does it do? He can see that he made an 80, but he doesn't know, you know, why did he lose 20 points or, you know, whatever. It doesn't do much good if he can't get the paper back. It also sort of defeats the purpose if I have to print the paper that uh, he turned in and give it back to him. So this was my uh, solution. And somebody else may have a better one, but this is the one I came up with. In my own Dropbox, I created a folder 
for each class period. And you can see here I made period Z, my fake period here. And then within that folder, there's a folder for each student. And it takes a little bit of time to set up, but really not too much time. And as you know, if you use Dropbox, you any one of these folders can have a public, you know, I mean a shared. You can share any one of these folders. So for each student, I just send each student at the beginning of the year, sometime near the beginning of the year, the um, link to his or her folder. And then when I've looked at something, if I've marked on it, whatever I've done to it, I can then deposit it back into that student's folder so only that student can see it. That's the workaround I came up with. We do not have Google Apps for Education, so this was kind of my workaround for that. Um, again, it's using my own personal Dropbox, but it's, it's very easy to do. I realized after those two fellows, those two science teachers really made flipped learning popular that I had been doing it for a few years. And I imagine many of you had too. Um, not to the extent that they do it, <laughs> but uh, made me feel good. Wow, I was, I was a real pioneer, wasn't I? <laughs> Here are some of the things that we can use for flipped learning classroom. Uh, anything that you want to flip. I flip a lot of my grammar lessons. I'm in a small Catholic high school. I imagine that I get students from 20 or 30 different middle schools, home schools, Catholic schools, uh, you know, public, all kinds of different schools. And they come with a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different backgrounds when they come in. And some have a lot, a very strong grammar background. Others have virtually none. So flipping things really helps me. Uh, screen, Screencastify is a good app. And there are others. But this is a good one. And as we learned last week from Paula, you can get an extension to put on your Google Chrome browser that uh, makes it very easy. Now, for years, I've used ScreenFlow on my Mac. I, I like that, but that's a bought program. Uh, but this one, Screencastify, is free. Uh, so that's, that's a good, good uh, option. Explain Everything is for the iPad. Again, with something like grammar, if I want to draw out a diagram or I want to explain something, it's very easy for me to draw it on my iPad and then very simply uploads to YouTube. And then, of course, that YouTube video is embedded in my live binder. So under the tab Grammar Videos, I then have a sub-tab that might say Chapter 1. And then for each section that I want to teach, you know, there will be a base tab with that video Im embedded into it. But explain everything is where those videos can actually be created. And of course, your students can create too, and then put them up on YouTube. And you can uh, pull those into your live binder if you wish, or um, whatever else you want to do with a student created video, but does uh, explain everything is the best iPad app that I have found. And there are several others, but that's the one that I use. Yes, and it's true, Peggy, <laughs> once you, you can use those over and over. And that's fantastic. I have some that are really old. One of the videos that I'm using, as a matter of fact, I still use, has a reference to Michael Phelps in the Olympics when he won what, eight or nine gold medals. Um, so some of the things are kind of outdated, but that's OK. Uh, no red ink for an English teacher. Wow, this is such, oh my goodness, I can't say enough good things about it, except that they don't have a premium version for the individual teacher yet. And I keep bugging them. I, I think they get real tired of me because I say, I'm in a small school. You know, we can't buy the entire premium version for the whole school or district. That's really what they seem to be marketing their premium version for. But the free version is good, too. And that's, uh, that's what I'm using. And with um, 
no red ink. You make, this is basically grammar and usage, punctuation, uh, these things that, wow, my, my ninth graders still struggle with. So I find this so very helpful. They, uh, what happens when they, and you can see I can make assignments, uh, quizzes, I can get diagnostics, uh, just so many things. You know, go to their site and look at all of the things that they have available because there are so many. And it, you also can see everything in, um, in real time. So if you were asking a student to do a particular exercise, you weren't sure, say there are 20 kids, 25 kids in the classroom, you're not sure who's getting it, who's not, you can see on your iPad or on your computer, you can walk around with your iPad and you can see live results of who is struggling and who's not. And you can also have it divided up by concept. So if someone is getting the idea of, I don't know, um, compound sentences or something, and how to punctuate various types of compound sentences and someone else is not, or the use of the semicolon or whatever, you can walk over to that particular student, even if they don't show signs of distress, and uh, you know, say, well, I, don't, I think you're struggling here. Let's, let's take a look. Now, this is something that a student would see. I found out, by the way, that this Kosuke, whatever his name is, that's a baseball player. I had to look that up. Now, why is that person's name on there? Because this student listed this person as a sports hero of theirs. Once the student first goes into No Red Ink, it asks a lot of questions about um, you know, who's your favorite, what are your favorite TV shows, who's your favorite sports star, whatever, your, your best friend's name, your pet's name, your teacher's name, whatever. It asks a lot of questions. And then it incorporates those into the sentences. And it's, it's cute. You know, the kids like that. They think that's fun. So as you can see here, what happens is the student is going to you know, drag the comma where it belongs, or drag the period or the semicolon. Then, and this is the really wonderful feature of No Red Ink, it gives immediate feedback. Did I get it right or not? And if I don't get it right, then it will give me a little hint and say, try again. I try again. If I miss it again, it'll give me another hint, a bigger hint this time. It'll give me another example of the sentence, of this type of sentence done correctly, and then it will give me another sentence to try until I get it right. So it reminds me of a video game and why kids like video games. You know, I only got up to this level, but I'm immediately going to try again and uh, keep working. So it's, um, I, I find it very, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> this slide again is just showing that you can put videos right into your live binder. I'm not sure if that could be done a few years ago or if I just didn't know how to do it, but I used to have a different website to embed all my learning videos and again that would be a little bit confusing. Now that I know I can put them right into the live binder. Again, I can keep everything in one place, and that's great. <coughs> bit strips. I've been using this one for years, too. Uh, but bit strips is a place where you can make cartoons. It's very easy. It's fun. I am not real artistic. I don't draw well or anything, but I don't have to with Bitstrips. There's also a Bitstrips EDU that has come along since I began using Bitstrips. I don't 
use that. I don't have my students make cartoons, or I haven't up to this point. I just haven't found the time. But I think, especially with younger students, you know, this that might be a lot of fun to go to Bitstrips Edu and set up something for a class. But what I do here, and my my avatar, by the way, my Aunt Tammy avatar is something I made years ago with this uh, with Bitstrips. But you can see what I've done here. I have a this is. Again, I did this years ago, but it was it, I'm kind of famous for it now with my students, is I have this little story um, about Vernon Verb, a man of action, and how he met and married Nancy Nam. And they produced Jerry Gerrand, who uh, looks like his dad, but he functions uh, like his mom. So he helps his mom with her six jobs that she does in the town of Sentenceford. And, uh, but unfortunately, again, this is a soap opera. Nancy and Vernon broke up, and he later married the evil Angela Adjective, who was able to uh, get him away from Nancy because she would say things like, oh, you're so handsome. You're wonderful. You're fantastic. And so anyway, they produced, after they got married, they produced Patty Participle. And she does what her mom does. She uh, modifies nouns. And this just shows the difference between a participle and a gerund. So it is pretty easy. I didn't find it real difficult to to do these. Uh, this one right here probably took, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, uh, maybe a little longer. You know, it's, it's like anything. You, you have a learning curve at the very beginning. But after you create the characters, that probably takes the most time, is creating the characters, uh, picking out the head shape, the, the hair color, the clothing, you know, all of that. But once you create the characters, just popping them into these uh, backgrounds or a variety of backgrounds that you can get uh, is pretty simple. And that, so that doesn't take too terribly long. Uh, class blogs, of course. Uh, I asked that question earlier, how many people have class blogs? I think most people do nowadays. And you can use those, too, in, in, uh, instead of your uh, live binder, if you prefer to do that. But I have found it much easier to use my live binder. I do use this class blog particularly for exemplars. So that would be some really good work that a student has turned in. A lot of times we'll put it on the Literary Lions blog so that other people can see it. Uh, inspirational stories uh, I can put there. And then, of course, there are buttons for the live binders. So they are down here as well. I don't use my Weebly blog extensively, but I really recommend Weebly as a fantastic and easy. I, even though I use a lot of technology, I'm not naturally a techie by any means, so I find this one so simple. I have a colleague, though, and when I told her I was doing a webinar, she gave me permission to use some screenshots of her blog. She uses a WordPress blog, and she does very well with it. So each day in her class, also as you can see in English class, last year she was teaching the 10th graders, so she was getting my 9th graders. And they seem to make the transition between my live binder setup and her uh, Word blog, her WordPress blog, very easily. But you can see what she does is she puts a different post every day. And she has you know, what she's doing each day, the objective, the homework. Everything is listed by day. It doesn't work as well for me because I like to have, if you need to find something from two months ago, I find it's a little easier for them to do on the, on the uh, live binder. But this works very well for her. Uh, I noticed, too, that she has everything filed under something like your daily objectives and homework. So if someone wanted to know 
from three weeks ago what the homework was. Um, you know, you could click on that and you would get all of those blog posts. So she does this beautifully. I really like the look of it. It's very professional looking, very professional looking. Uh, here's another picture of that and you can see that she can also embed um, videos in hers. So that works out. So different strokes for different folks, but I, she is one of these very organized people. You know, she's very different than I am because she is very organized just by nature. And uh, I could, oh, this is just so beautiful what she does. Uh, free online classics. If you don't know about Project Gutenberg, that's certainly worth knowing. Your students can get online versions of things like Great Expectations, one of the books that I teach. So they can find that online. And for students who perhaps need a book read to them, um, I really like LibriVox. And I didn't make a slide for that. I didn't think about it at the time, but it's L-I-B. R I V O X and yes, you got it spelled there, right? Uh, LibriVox actually has volunteer readers, so some are really great and some maybe aren't, but most of them that I've heard are very good. Anything again like Gutenberg, if it's out of if it's in public domain, you can get a free recording. Just as here at Project Gutenberg you can get the free text. But uh, LibriVox has been a godsend for some of my students who really uh, like to have the book read as they're reading, as they're, you know, they're reading along. So again, if you have students with some special needs or who just like that, uh, LibriVox, along with Project Gutenberg, they're both free, can give you those resources. We use, we have a textbook that has an online version and my students, again, since it's a private school, they buy their own books. So they can buy either a hard copy of the book or they can buy an online version of the book, which is a lot less expensive. I do keep a class set in my room so they don't absolutely have to have the hard copy to, you know, schlep back and forth because they're very big. <laughs> Literature books are very heavy. Uh, so I keep on my live binder a link to our particular textbook. And then all the student has to do is enter their code. Each one of them, they, they buy that, um, that code. It goes into this box. And then that takes them right to the online textbook. Again, especially for my ninth graders, having everything in one place has been great for them. Educanon and Edpuzzle, again, they've been around for maybe a couple of years now. Um, but with these, for the flipped learning, or if you just want to make sure that a student watched a video and you want to know if he or she understood, uh, these are two fantastic fantastic resources. I use Educanon. I have used Edpuzzle too, but they do the same thing pretty much. They have slightly different features. I've just, over the years, the last couple of years, just stuck with Educanon. But Edpuzzle is wonderful too. So try them both if you're not familiar with them and see which works better for you. Uh, and this is how, uh, this is how it works. As the student plays the um, as the student plays the video, it's going to stop wherever you have asked it to stop and ask them a question. You can see here the question. It's, this is showing everything in one screen here, uh, and then they have to answer the question, and then they can play on. Again, you can get live results, so you can see if you happen to have them doing it within the class how they're doing. 
uh, or of course you can give it for homework and then you can get just an overall view of how each student did. But what it does, because when we all started doing some flipped lessons, we realized that just like any homework, some students do it and some students don't. So for those who do it, this is a great way to prove that you did it. And also you find that, for instance, if you gave them a worksheet or a page in a book to do, questions to answer, they could always just copy from their friend. But it's a lot harder to get a friend to take the time to go in and sign in with your name and do all the questions, take the time to do the video for you. It's one thing to hand you my paper to copy. It's quite another for me to take the time to actually do it for you. So um, that maybe cuts down on that a little bit. Uh, with Educanon, I also can print a worksheet. So if the student wanted to print out the answers, print out the questions and the answers to keep, then she could do that. But she, I don't force anybody to do that, but you certainly could, and that uh, can be very helpful as well. Exactly. You can't say the dog ate my homework. Uh, so that that's the one wonderful thing about Educan and, and Edpuzzle. It really added something to the whole flipped learning uh, concept that they would have to um, you know, have some accountability, have some proof. Um, you know that they're not just sort of listening while they're doing something else because they have to answer these questions as they go along. Now again, you can put, you can see the video that's there now called All My Grammar. Um, that was my takeoff on all my children, you know, the, the soap opera. So this is the video that actually explains what Nancy now does, her six jobs in a sentence, and so each one, as you can see, I first talk about the subject of a sentence, so there's a question about that. Uh, the predicate nominative next, and so can you identify predicate nominative after it's been explained, and so on. This is real basic grammar, but again, some of my students haven't had any grammar, um, and some would find this you know, ridiculously easy. Uh, for formative assessment, here are a few things that I use, especially for formative assessment. Applied practice online is something that I used for years and years. They have these wonderful books, and but you pay like $50 for each book. Unless you go to a conference and find the ones that are kind of scuffed up, they sell them for a little less. And you can make copies from them. And what I really appreciated about them is that they're set up to prepare students for uh, the AP exam, for the SAT test. You can also get them that are that are formatted for uh, Texas. They used to call it the STAR test. I'm not sure if it's still called that. But uh, I especially used it for my pre-AP classes because you get those very, very difficult multiple choice questions that are based on literature. So they'll have the literary passage and then they'll have the, um, the questions. And I usually put kids in teams to to pick the question to find the answer because it's hard for freshmen. These are AP questions. And then we have little contests and that sort of thing. So uh, this was wonderful. And then there's an explanation for why each answer was chosen. And so for a long time, I pass out the packets. I spent a lot of paper, you know, Xeroxing these packets. And uh, they would try to find the answer. And then we would talk about. Uh, the explanation why the uh, certain answer was correct and another answer was not. And then they went to, oh, wait a minute, I thought, uh, they went to the, um, uh, they put it online. So now I can assign each class uh, the assignment and I get a grade sheet. I see what students have completed, what students have, have it. They can still work in pairs. You can still work it out that way or in teams. And the student can see the explanation immediately after finishing the short section. Each section is based on the literary passage, maybe only has seven or eight questions. 
And then as soon as they finish, they can see the explanation. This was the correct answer, and this is the reason why. Yeah, I do have them work in teams, as, especially as freshmen, because these are very difficult questions, and they get elated when they get the right one. I mean, <laughs> so then they'll go from getting 30% of them correct to getting 70 or 80% of them correct. Uh, and they feel really good about you know, how they've learned to start interpreting these questions and really pay attention to what it's asking. And it's great for close reading, I mean, because you've got to do the close reading to be able to understand the question. Uh, I think we all know and love Kahoot by now, but if you haven't heard of that, wow, is this an exciting way to end a class or begin a class with a review on Kahoot. Again, they can play on Teams. Um, once they've, you, you put the question up, you put the, um, uh, the question or you start playing the game up on the smart board and then all of the students can sign in on their mobile learning devices. That's what we call telephones, cell phones, we don't call them phones, we call them mobile learning devices. So they can sign in on a mobile learning device, again, can play in teams. We play for Pogue Bucks, which are extra credit points, and uh, you can use a Pogue Buck on anything. So you know, if, you want, if you made an 80 on a test and you want to make a 90, you have 10 Pogue Bucks. If you saved up that many, you can increase your grade. The kids will do a, a lot for extra credit that they won't do just for regular grades. That just seems to be human nature. So we play for Pogue Bucks a lot of times. But uh, again, a lot of fun. You go to getkahoot.com for to make the tests, to make the quizzes, and to use other people's tests or quizzes, games. Some of them is just some of them are just trivia games. They're a lot of fun. Uh, and then you can go, the students go to kahoot.it in order to play. Right. So I see some people are listing some things that I'm going to add to my Timmy's Tech Tools Life Binder. Great. ClassTools.net, another oldie but goodie. He keeps adding more and more to ClassTools.net. Again, very simple. It's very simple. But he's got some great stuff. He's got a fake book. Uh, where the students can make a Facebook type page for their uh, for character in a story, and they have to know a lot about that character in order to be able to do this. But I always go back. My very favorite is the arcade game, and once I've put in a set of questions and answers, for instance, Greek and Latin roots that we're learning, I can put 20 of those into this, and I get five different games. Uh, and so students can go to the flashcards or the matching pairs if they like that. Cannonball and Manic Miner are two things that are a lot of fun to play on your own computer. I think I have a picture of Manic Miner here. And it's like a real primitive little game, but you can see that, uh, for instance, here's the uh, here is the uh, definition, and then you have to pick out what is the word that matches that. And so these little yellow boxes float up and down, and the little man is controlled by the student, and he has to try to make the little man hit the correct yellow box. And when he does, he gets points. But of course, he's also trying to avoid the bad thing up here that will blow him up. And at the top of one of these, I don't see it on this shot, but on the top of one of these, once he gets to the top, there's a toilet that, you know, the character jumps into the toilet and goes to the next level. So they all think that's a hoot, too. Um, so a lot of my students like to play that. Um, and then word shoot is really my favorite because this works so beautifully on a smart board. This, um, you see, you have the definition, and then you have all of the terms here. This is literary terms, obviously. And once you hit the correct little lozenge or whatever this bullet, whatever this thing is, it blows up with a very satisfying boom. And you get try getting a group, a couple of boys up there 
trying to get a high score and slapping that smart board. Oh, they love that. So this is one that I use a lot. Um, they always have fun with that. They can also play it on their own computers or their own devices and compete for points. Now the tough thing is maybe I've put 20 um, definitions and words in there. And so they'll show up, you know, maybe eight at a time, as you see here, and different ones will show up in different rounds. But after the first round, these little lozenge things start moving. And so by the time it gets to the fourth or fifth round, I can't play it anymore because I can't hit them fast enough. But the kids can. And so they are searching for that one term that they need to find, and they're trying to find it as it's scooting all over the um, the screen, and that makes it a lot of fun, too. Socrative, um, again, great thing for formative assessment. You can watch you put your quiz in. You simply give the kids code. They go straight to it. They can do the quiz. You see in real time who's getting it, who's not. And as you can see here, there are a lot of different ways you can use the uh, tool. And they have very good uh, support website. They have a lot of um, you know, the YouTube videos, which taught me, among other things, taught Peggy and I, uh, taught Peggy and me, how to, um, how to pronounce it, <laughs> Socrative which is not the way I was pronouncing it at first, but another great tool. Uh, Turnitin.com, I know a lot of us have that at our schools. I just wanted to point out the fact that there are a lot of things besides just searching for plagiarism. There's a lot more to it than that. You can see on this one, um, I can, you can see that there is a peer mark uh, assignment here. This is where the student turns in a draft of a paper and then you can ask, turn it in to assign, to shuffle the papers and give each student the paper from a different person. And they, you, you know, of course you're going to give them a rubric or whatever things to look for and they can um, make their comments and then it, of course, will go back to the original author. So this is something that I find very helpful for peer editing. So that is uh, built in to turn it in and I don't know if everybody knows that it's there. Uh, you can get a lot of um, just overall view of what your class is doing here on Turnitin. And they have a discussion page, which has only come up in the last couple of years, where you can actually have threaded discussions. You can put up a topic and let the students answer that topic and discuss on, uh, on the discussion page. So it's something, again, you may not know that Turnitin can do. And formative, I just found formative, fabulous, fabulous site. I can, again, make folders for the various things that I'm teaching. And here is something really cool. If you have an old test, it's in a Word document or a PDF, you can upload it to formative and it will help you create out of that test, out of that old test. Maybe you made it on Easy Test Maker and you have downloaded a copy. You can put it onto formative. Of course, I guess that would be redundant because you can do that. You can also have them take the test on Easy Test Maker. But if it's an old test that you happen to have it printed, you can uh, put it in here and it will upload it and give you uh, a test that can be taken online. So, and again, instant, instant feedback to the student, which is so helpful. And then finally, I just wanted to remind you of Remind. So here again, your students or your parents can uh, sign up for your class and you send the, um, you know, the homework or whatever reminder that you want to out as a text message. And a lot of my students have found this helpful uh, as, as their parents because in ninth grade you're trying to let go but you kind of, ooh, sometimes maybe mom just wants to be aware and so she can get the same assignment that 
you know, her child is getting and just be aware uh, if she doesn't want to go to the live binder every day. And for students, this can be a good reminder as well. And so that's, oh, I finished right on time. But I don't know how much time is left for questions, so I'll be glad to answer what I can. Thanks, Tammy. I did manage to capture a few questions. So going to one of the early um, resources, Planbook EDU. I noticed there was a, a premium cost on that slide. So is Planbook not free? Planbook is free. It's one of those that uh, are either free or premium depending on which features mm -hmm. you want to have. Okay. And I'm not sure which features are and which aren't. Okay. But there is a free version to try out. Yes. Good. Um, I'm not sure. I know you answered about, or you talked about with Bitstrips, how much time it took you to make mm -hmm. those comics. Uh, how right. easy is it for students to create these comic strips? Oh. It's like anything else. It's much easier for them than it is for us. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, they usually pick up something like that very quickly. Right. And for Turnitin, is the peer editing only available in a paid subscription? I think Turnitin is only paid. Oh, I only think Turnitin paid. is something that, um, that schools have to buy. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that, but uh, this was something that we had asked for at our school, mm -hmm. and it was it's done uh, as a school. So uh, as far as I know, there is not a free version of Turnitin. Someone else okay. may know better than I. Mm -hmm. All right, those were the questions I was able to capture during. Tammy's presentation. If anyone else has any questions for her, you can please type it in chat and I'll ask them. Are you considering trying out Google Classroom? I would love to have Google Classroom, but my school doesn't have it. I see. Google okay. Apps for Education. So you have to have Google okay. Apps for Education in your school. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because that's some of the things you know that I've done kind of a workaround. Right. I could do very easily in, in Google Classroom. <laughs> I don't see some other people that are typing. Oh, I could scoot down here and see. <laughs> and scoot mm -hmm. down the chat. Tammy yeah, I don't know. Still paid, yeah. Patty. Not yeah. turn it in. Still paid, paid, and no longer a free version. But well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, sure. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. If there, if there is a free limited version, I don't know about it. I just once we got it at our school. It's a uh, school wide, right? Program. And then I realized, you know, they send out updates, and mm -hmm. I don't think everyone knows all the time that they have these things like peer editing and mm. discussion pages and all. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Remind Any other, has some new things now. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Tammy? Well, I think it's Paula who said this is going to go a lot faster than I thought because I was always afraid I wouldn't have enough here. But uh -huh. uh, it did. It did. It went quickly. And I do have more. Um, I try to keep a, a live binder for my colleagues called Tammy's Tech Tools. And I've kept that for several years. So I think there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a link to that. It has a lot more on it. Do you have a total for your for your out of pocket cost for the paid mm. tools? 
Wow. Or an estimate for the cost? I would say I probably spend about $150 maybe. Mm -hmm. No, I, I call this my hobby, <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's how I justify the cost. And sometimes you can get a department or something to, to reimburse right. you for some of these things. You know. Right. Yeah, that's true. We all spend a lot of money, and I guess I spend more now on these sort of things rather than so much, uh, you know, at the office depot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely I take the deduction. <laughs> I think we get up to $250, don't we? I think we're out of questions, so we'll go ahead and, and continue. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy to mention the upcoming shows. Well, thank you so much, Tammy. So many new ideas and tools for us to explore and love having them in the live binder. I want to let you all know we have some great shows coming up. And I mentioned in the chat, next week we're going to have Valerie Burton back. And she's got some great tools to share with us that she uses for um, responses to uh, student reading, text reading, and, and annotations and things like that. I know you're going to learn a lot from that. And then we're going to have a panel on Remind.com with Lucy Gray and a couple of Remind Connected educators. So I'm really looking forward to that because they've added so many new features to Remind and it's important for us to learn about those and it's totally free. No show on September 5th, Labor Day, holiday weekend. And then on September 12th, we have a fabulous guest coming. Matt Miller is the author of Ditch That Textbook. And we're thrilled to have him coming on to share some of the things he has learned and done and uh, written up in his uh, book, which is awesome. And then on September 19th, we're going to introduce all of you to the K-12 online conference because that will be coming up in October and I know you're going to want to know about it and participate because it's all free. I also want to turn this back over to Lori to share with us about just a couple of quick things. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest venture. He's gathered together all of his professional development in one place, including the Host Your Own webinar. So you can sign up for a free Blackboard Collaborate room as long as you make your session public. Um, that session's free. You have no charge for using the room. The Teacher Entrepreneurship Week is August 24th to the 27th, so that's coming up. And Steve is going to be guiding, leading this. This is one of the events on the Learning Revolution, so that's coming up very soon, 24th to the 27th of August. And the uh, guests. You may recognize some of the names down here because some of those folks have been presenters here with Classroom 2.0 Live. When you exit the session uh, and <laughs> go back to that live binder, one of the forms in the resources section is the feature teacher form. And Tammy was our feature teacher for this month of August. You can also take the direct link to the form here. Uh, if you are a teacher, you can nominate yourself as a feature teacher as well. When you exit the session as well, your browser should open this, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. This is the URL for the, directly to get to the survey. You can take the link in the chat, which Peggy has just placed there, or in the uh, Live Binder. In the Classroom 2.0 Live Resource tab, you'll find a tab for the 
survey there as well. On the survey, at the bottom, are two fields to request a professional development certificate. And they now have your name on their certificate. That's been an update for the past few months. When you request this, make sure you use a personal email address to receive it. You'll fill in your name in one field and then an email address in the other. However, don't use a school address. Those email clients tend to block you from getting this. The video and audio collection for recordings are on iTunes U, so you can use a uh, an Apple device to either watch and listen or just listen to past shows. There are recordings also available as an RSS feed. You can get that link in the Classroom 2 Live site, as well as the full, the full recording for past archives. So many places to get past recordings. Again, special thanks to our special guest, Tammy Poe, to Steve Harvidon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming.